Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Erin Meyer. I'm the Sustainable Food Programs Coordinator at the University of California, Merced. Um, I coordinate a variety of programs around food waste, food rescue, sustainable food. Um, and over the pandemic, we needed some things to do and we wanted to talk to cool people. So Guillermo and I started this um, AMA series, Ask Me Anything, uh, with just guests on a variety of topics related to sustainability or food, what have you. And so we are thrilled to have an awesome AMA today with Alfonso Morales. And I'll let him introduce himself after Guillermo does his little spiel introducing himself as well too. Uh-oh, Guillermo, we can't hear you. Oh, look at that. Uh, hello everyone, I'm Guillermo Ortiz. I am the Sustainability and Diversity Educational Programs Manager. So I cover the intersection really between sustainability and equity and we're starting this AMA to hear from different perspectives in the different in the sustainability world. So thank you, Alfonso, for accepting our invitation and being here today. I'll turn it over to you to introduce yourself and then we can start the conversation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Guillermo. You and Aaron both. Hello, everybody. <laughs> My name is Alfonso Morales. I am a Vilas Distinguished Achievement Professor of Planning and Landscape Architecture in the Department of, Landscape, of Planning and Landscape Architecture at the University of Wisconsin at, at Madison. I am also chair of the department. Uh, I have been a professor for 25 years at three different universities, but I grew up in farming and ranching in West Texas and New Mexico. I milked a cow when I was a kid and butchered animals with my dad and brother and did a lot of other farm work, farm and ranch work. So at Wisconsin, I do a lot of different things. One of the things I do, and I'm gonna rock it because it's Farmer's Market Week, farmtofacts.org, right? Uh, this cool t-shirt is an organization that uh, it's a toolkit for farmer's market managers that I founded, that I created and founded at the university six or eight years ago. And it operates in the United States and Canada, in, in Sonoma and Marin counties there in California and other states across the US and, and provinces in Canada. <laughs> and I have been writing about uh, marketplaces and street vendors for 30 years. And I was a vendor in Chicago, street vendor in Chicago for my dissertation research. And, and my work, I've testified to the House and Senate staffers in DC, to the New York City Council, to the state of Nebraska, to a number of jurisdictions around the country and helping to make a place for local foods and for street markets and farmers markets and street vendors. Uh, I could say more, but I will stop there and ask me anything. <laughs> yeah, Alfonso, I'll, I'll take a stab at that. Uh, it's funny that you mentioned testifying in front of Congress. I used to work as a legislative correspondent for Senator Robert Menendez from New Jersey. I worked on housing and financial services policy. Um, and so you've testified in front of committee, I, I assume is what you were called up. Uh, I've always wondered what's that experience like uh, to be to be in front of right, a congressional committee uh, for, right. your, for your expertise. Right. So just to clarify, Memo, I have been to the, to the Hill to talk to House and Senate staffers, not committees. I have testified okay. to the New York City Council. And I suspect that's not a big difference. No, yeah. <laughs> what, was that, what was that experience that was, like? That was pretty, that was, and, and I've spoken to hundreds of people in lectures in Europe and the United States and Canada, uh, uh, including, you know, uh, provincial government, governments in, in, the Europe, in the European Union. But anyways, it's a lot of fun. I, I have to tell you, the, the best the best thing I, I can say uh, about my job, one of the funnest things about my job is going and helping people think about, become aware of, develop a perception of equity needs and uh, diversity in local foods. I help them develop a perception of the extraordinary history of marketplaces, thousands of years, 
the enormous importance marketplaces have had for society, for Western European society and, and its inheritors. And so for, for me, it's been one of the great joys of my life, speaking to folks like that. Uh, they, they, I, they don't usually ask me very hard questions. <laughs> you know, it's actually pretty easy, you know, because, you know, you know, you train for something a lot, you know a lot about it. So it's not, you know, it's not, it's not too tough to deal with. But thank you for your question. Somebody else, ask me anything. Please, Claudia, go ahead. Hi. Oops. That's okay. Oh, That's a nice picture, too. Oh. Here, you my can. Sister. Here's, here's one of sister. my pictures. Let me see. I'll, so uh, I live in Monona, Wisconsin, and I use your um, software. And I'm a, I get the Farm to Facts newsletter. I'm a retired CPA, and I took over. We have a vibrant uh, community market. And vibrant dogs in the background here. Enough, Quadro. Um, there was a group of women who started it 15 years ago or so, and and then now there's a new group of us. And I've really upgraded systems, like instead of the bookkeeping on uh, um, Spiral Notebook, it's on QuickBooks now. <laughs> That's just an example. My concern and question, as I pursue all the different aspects of this farmer's market business, is I want to institutionalize it. I don't want it to become, and I don't mean that in a, you know, in a way that's going to diminish the grassroots aspects and the access to, for farmers, for new farmers. We have actually two farmers who are farming on incubated land at the Farley Center. You may know the Farley Center. We've got two of those farmers, yep. I, um, it, it's tough to attract black farmers if there are any. I have a black baker. But so I'm tr really working hard on diversity, but also wanting to find a way to finance it to sustain our, our fees for the market are low as low as they come. I just, you know, for the vendors, which is my goal, you know, to keep that low. So I guess the bigger picture kind of thought thinking is what I'm asking. How do we, how do we keep from having to keep searching for money and staff? And um, I've got lots of experience with nonprofits, so I'm going to draw on that, but I would be interested in your thoughts. Sure thing. That's a great question, Claudia. And I got to get over there and visit one of these days since you're since you're in the neighborhood. We have, um, music. We have music every Sunday morning from 10 to noon. <laughs> there we go. And that's a great example of the wonderful things that happen in farmers markets, right? Outdoor, mm -hmm. outdoor spaces. So your question has three parts, Claudia. Let's remember, folks, Claudia's question. How is it that we institutionalize? How do we organize uh, a market? so that it's sustainable, so it's long lasting, okay? How do we put in place procedures and protocols? So right. Claudia uses the farm to fact stuff because that helps her, right? Helps her measure aspects of the market she wants to measure. And it's the ones she wants to measure. Even though the university developed it, we don't impose on her what to do. We no. support her in what's going on. So an important part of institutionalization is really being able to do what you want to do yourself. And Claudia is an example of doing that, of, of being able to do for yourself what you otherwise wouldn't have been able to do. So that's why she uses this tool and that's why there are tools like it around the country. So that's one part of institutionalization, identifying goals and being able to do what you want to do. Another important part that, that Claudia mentioned is uh, diversifying markets, having enough farmers around to keep your market vibrant. <clears throat> and a lot of people want farmers of color and they want farmers of color because they're serving communities that are diverse communities. So they want the market to feel like the community. And that makes good sense. Unfortunately, in Wisconsin, there are not a lot of farmers of color. There are a few, the Farley Center uh, Farm Incubator that she mentioned is, is among the the organizations that incubates farmers of color. 
but so there are a few, but in the absence of uh, enough to populate your market, a thing that you could try, Claudia, is going to the local high schools in your area, the FFA programs, the Future Farmers of America programs, and go in the fall and tell them that you want to start, you want one of or two of those kids to start farming, right, in February, March, April, you know, to use a hoop house or something and to be able to sell in the, in the, in the market. And so you do a couple of things. One, you advance their educational aspirations. I was in FFA when I was a kid and I did a lot of things and it enabled me to, to, to do more things in college and graduate school after. But another thing that is, is it reminds people when they see a young face, hopefully they're in Monona, there's a number of kids of color in that you know, school district, you know, hopefully that they start, they see a possibility they see an option for themselves in terms of careers. So the commitment to grow our own farmers is a long commitment. You know, it's something that you have to say to yourself and your board of directors that's on the farmer's market board. We need to make a commitment, a five-year commitment. And each year we're gonna reach out. We're gonna continue reaching out to farmers. We're gonna reach out to young people and we're gonna try and grow our own farmers. And I suspect, Laudia, in five years, you're going to have some success. Matter of fact, I'll bet. Okay. So the third aspect, so Claudia mentions institutionalization. What do we mean by institutionalization? Well, we mean being able to do things on your own and having people come along and work with you. So we've covered those two parts of it. What's something else we mean by institutionalization? We mean habits of mind, right? We mean work habits. We mean standard operating procedures. So one of the things Claudia wants people to do is when they wake up Sunday mornings, she wants them to think about music at the market. She wants that habit in their minds, right? And so she's reaching out in social media. She's reaching out in different ways to create a habit in people's minds. Where does that, what does that do? That makes more people support the market. And one of the things that Claudia, if I can suggest, take your data to the city council in Wapaka, Wisconsin, among a number of other places around the US. They take data from the market, they take it to the bank, they take it to the city council, and they say, look, this is what we're doing. This is the success we're having, support us. And that is a, another element of a institutionalized, of a sustainable, well-institutionalized market. I hope that that answer is clear to folks. I hope that makes sense. Do you want to tag on Claudia or somebody else? Ask me anything. Claudia, this is your yet. So um, speaking on what um, Alfonso was saying here in Minnesota, I actually work with an organization called Seeds Feeds and they were doing just what you are doing three, four years ago. And now through their journey now today, they have implemented gardening, urban farms and schools. They are starting to talk about um, racial or not racial justice only through the schools, but also about food justice, what it means to eliminate stigma of poverty through communities. Um, and they're really targeting communities of color. And so every night we just started probably like second week of July, I want to say. Um, we did these, we call them Aquila Nights, which is an elementary school that we're really working with um, and their students because we found that when COVID hit, that community was hit the hardest and a lot of the parents lost their jobs. So there was a lot of, um, there was a lot of issues obtaining food and parents with transportation and so on. So what we do is we cook Every Tuesday, we bring food and meals. We ask folks, you know, bring Tupperware if you'd like, and we let people take food home. But at the same time, we show people how to garden. We get the kids involved. So those are really good ideas to have. If I can react to, react to that, you know, uh, we were just sharing our toolkit with the folks in White Earth in northern Minnesota. Yeah, yeah. So if we can be supportive of you, 
with our approach to data collection, let us know, okay? Now, something that she points out that I think is very helpful to remember is that there's always a number of dimensions associated with food. Food doesn't come at us just in calories. Food comes at us in a number of different dimensions. And so we have to consider in our particular context, what makes sense for us to uh, advance our goals? What are our goals? Which goals make sense for us? <clears throat> so to Yayet's uh, point, we work with, I have had several USDA grants with an organization in Rhode Island, Hope and Made. It's a food incubator. They've incubated 300 food businesses, very successful food incubator on the East Coast. We do economic analysis for them. So, you know, uh, help them understand the economic impact of all their food businesses. But they also have a farmer's market and they use the farmer's market to do two things. One, to address food security in the community and two, as a test bed for the products that their food businesses are incubating, right? So, so the, the businesses go and start up at the Hope and Main Food Business Incubator. They, they develop their product, they develop their recipe, then they sell it at the market and see if people like it. <laughs> you know, they test it out. And so they sell it discounted. So that's food security. So we have a win-win situation, right? You have inexpensive food available and other sorts of supportive programs that Hope and Maine does. And you have food entrepreneurship. So some low-income people have actually started food businesses at the incubator. Does that make sense to you, Yadia? Do you see the reciprocal relationship there? Yes, I do. And, and that's very helpful. Um, especially when you're trying to convey a message. And I feel like as community leaders, we have to understand how we're conveying the message, but also who are we conveying that message and who are we missing out that is not receiving that message. I feel like that's very important as well. I agree that that is very important, the messaging. And I wanna say that here in the greater Madison area, every one of the aspects that you were mentioning, the, the food incubator, um, the the cooking classes, all everything exists here. Not, um, not really through farmers markets so much as other nonprofit organizations. And maybe it's time for those organizations to have a meeting of their boards or some sort of council um, to share resources and goals and so forth. Because there's a lot of food activity in this town. Um, beyond, I mean, you know. Alfonso, it's like everywhere. But to the other woman's point, not everybody knows about this right. at all levels of society. That's right. That's right. It's a constant. Uh, I make a lot of efforts locally and nationally and actually a little bit internationally as well to yeah. foster uh, this kind of multidimensional thinking, this kind of inclusive thinking across difference of various kinds of differences in society in order to enable people to better identify goals that are suited to their local context. When we do that, we've got a winner. You know, uh, you, you work with Just Bakery, Claudia, I, I presume? Is it Where's Just? Who? Just Bakery? No, uh, they've got a new bakery, K and C. We've uh, had people, we have uh, vendors that cook at the feed kitchens. Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. So, so there's, so we're mentioning organizations in Madison that are part of the ecosystem of food businesses, right? And it's getting those folks together. That's very important. Uh, in fact, uh, I should mention that I'm part of a new national science foundation grant that Ooh. to use artificial intelligence to support local foods of different kinds. And so I'm going to drop in the chat a couple of things. Let's see. So uh, yes, Norma, I'll address that in just one second. So makefoodyourbusiness.org, that is Hope and Maine in, in, in Rhode Island. I, I would like very much also, if, if I can get it, Just Bakery. This is another organization. Uh, they, uh, this is a bakery 
that became sustainable, that became that achieved sustainability, economic sustainability, by finding institutional clients, in particular hospitals in Madison. Oh, yeah. And the hospital clients um, started making purchases from the, the formerly incarcerated people, the returning citizens, as I like to call them. Uh, and they have done enormous work. Unfortunately, my browser is dead. I hope my connection is good. I hope you all can still hear me. Just Baker, here we go. Uh, here we go. Copy. So I encourage you all to look at just Baker, the model that they have uh, as well. Um, okay, so Norma, Norma Cardona, thank you so much for your question, Norma. How can the technology industry help in these endeavors? That's a really good question. There's a number of different ways to help. Um, could you, would you mind telling me your uh, role in the industry? Because it's likely I could be more precise, but I will give a few different ways. Okay, yeah. Um, thank you, Dr. Morales Alfonso. Uh, it's really great to be here today. Um, my name is Norma Cardona, and I am the Vice President of Bitwise Industries. And um, at the heart of what we do is to train up and upskill people from marginalized communities. That means formerly incarcerated people, uh, formerly homeless people, people from the LGBTQIA plus uh, community, um, you know, monolingual speakers, people with visible and invisible disabilities. And so we train people through our workforce training program. Um, you know, the first step is that they take up pre-apprenticeship classes that are either paid for or they earn through a scholar or they get a scholarship for it. But ultimately what we do is provide an apprenticeship opportunity where these people who take classes go into the apprenticeship um, and get full benefits. Uh, they get a livable wage um, and they are trained in the tech industry. And they're about, I'm sorry, I'm outside, uh, you know, baking in the sun while I listen to this. Um, so, um, ooh, where was I? And so um, we, you know, it's the livable wage, full benefits, um, and um, um, I'm sorry, and uh, and they get um, men, uh, dental, full dental, full medical, full um, optometric uh, benefits, and so um, you know we really upskill them. And most of these people we end up hiring once they're you know through their apprenticeship program. And so um, that's what we do. It's a three prong ecosystem, and one of the important things is that these apprentices not only are they earning while they're learning, they're also working with uh, professionals in our tech consulting um, department, which does uh, app development and web page development as well. And so that's kind of the gist of it. And so I'm just very interested in, you know, we're in Merced, California. And so there's a really great opportunity right now um, to do, you know, to offer these, these opportunities to people in an intentional way. And so this goes really, one of the important things that we do is that we also, um, you know, work to, uh, remove any barriers that people are experiencing to accessing the pre-apprenticeship and the apprenticeship opportunity. And so, you know, from also from that lens, I'm interested in knowing how can we be, how can we be partners with others who are, you know, fighting for food justice? I follow you. Excellent cool. question. I'm sure a number of people have responses. Let me go first though, if it's okay. I'm going to do little, I'm going to do little things. Uh, Oh, I've got a family emergency, it looks like. My wife just texted me. I'm going to do a couple of little things and then turn the conversation over to you. And, but then I'll, I'm, I'm going to be on, but I'm going to be back. One, have a look at our Farm to Facts webpage, Norma. And let's partner. Let's try and partner in grant writing. We've, we have worked with uh, California organizations, agricultural community events in Sonoma and Marin counties has 10 farmers markets. We work with them. Maybe there's some opportunities to do some app development in the sector, okay? Another thing that occurs to me is you've got a strong model. Partner with local, try and create this food system that we're talking about. Um, you know, I, I, I need to, I need to, I need to, and, and a third thing, well, I, I need to, I'm gonna mute myself, I'm sorry. Please talk. Mm 
Norma, congratulations on Bitwise. Thank you so much, Erin. I really appreciate it. Yeah, I'd love to hear more about what you're doing. Yeah, most definitely. Um, yeah, we'll email each other and we can, uh, you know, meet next week. Cool. Hi, everybody. It's great to be here. How are you leaving? Oh, no, no, no. Are there more people here still? Uh, yeah, I thought you said bye. Oh, no, no, no. I did it. Sorry. Oh, okay. I just have really bad hearing. <laughs> Sorry, my bad. Um, I have a question, though. I was speaking with someone that used to work at Bitwise. I don't know if they still do. And at one point, they had like a take care program, um, which was like helping or ideally helping food banks get more food into their pantry. Um, and I asked them if we could maybe put a community bridge at the Bitwise location over there on, uh, what is it, Main Street. Um, I don't know if you would be receptive to that sort of thing, having a community bridge in that spot. Yeah, I think it'd be, um... I think it's worth the conversation, um, you know, to have with our leadership, um, you know. And so, yeah, just email me so we can talk more about it, about this this opportunity and even maybe even more opportunities. Oh, yeah, we'll do. Does anyone have any questions for like Guillermo or I? So I'm the Sustainable Food Programs Coordinator at UC Merced and I conduct, uh, coordinate a variety of food rescue programs. So I can chit chat about that. Um, or Guillermo works around the issues of equity, diversity and inclusion. And so he can speak to things related to that and sustainability as well. I did have a question. So I work for the city of San Luis Park here in Minnesota, and my job is racial equity outreach. Um, and I work with a lot of nonprofits. And what we're seeing is that a lot of the nonprofits that work through sustainability, um, as well as food justice, are having a really hard time presenting to council, um, just because council wants data and wants proof that and this is going to sound really stupid, but they want proof that there is a food crisis, which we all know that there is. Um, but what, how have you guys been able to present this to your local um, cities or governors um, of the state or whoever it is that you guys have presented and what barriers have you guys have had to um, go through in order to get some sort of su support or grants or just, I don't know. So I'm, I'm sorry, I'm gonna jump in to the middle of the conversation again. That's a great question. There, you, there are many allies. In Minnesota, I can think of, for instance, the Minnesota Farmers Market Association. I'm blanking on the woman's name right now, but reach out to her because she's going to state government looking for support for food security. And in terms of data, the USDA, the Food Security Atlas, has is a, one important source of data on this problem. So please have a look at it. Uh, I think another, uh, I, I don't think people utilize their faith-based communities enough. I think that faith-based communities can be a source of support, not just for fundraising, not at all, but for intellectual support and political support for these questions of food insecurity and broad, more broadly speaking, food justice, right? So not only the destigmatization that you're speaking of, which is so important, but the empowerment through food of communities. Somebody else want to go? I'm sorry. Go ahead. I, um, well, I just wanted to say that um, the group we deal with, the government group here, is the Monona Parks and Rec Department. And when we took over, that relationship was not great between the people who were running the market and the parks and rec director. So we've learned to build back that relationship. We've done that really well. Um, it's taking time, but I think that that is a first step to doing what Alfonso, you recommended that we do is take the statistics or data. We'll have to go through Parks and Rec to get to City Council. We'll go to the Parks and Rec board first. But we've been, our board's been talking about that. And now I need to help put, help them put a plan in place 
to get us at the table for Parks and Rec, particularly um, for long-term goals, but um, a shorter term goal is they're about to redo the big park we're in. And I want a seat at the table for that discussion. But the relationships, they're personal it's, uh, on some level. They're, they're just very important, I think, in order. So now we have two board members, um, one board member who had been has on the Parks and Rec Department. We have another volunteer who's on Parks and Rec Board. So, you know, we're just building up the relationships and hoping that then once we get our act together and take, you know, what what we are finding at the market and what, what our goals are, that they'll be interested. Yeah, one thing I would add, um, I think the, one of the benefits of our advocacy work within uh, the Office of Sustainability at, U at UC Merced uh, is that we, at UC Merced is a research institution. And so um, we have the benefit of having faculty members who are in communities doing said research that they can supply to uh, nonprofit organizations or we can use to advocate um, to local officials or, or to state officials, for example. And the benefit of being within the University of California system uh, and serving the population of California, um, we are able to produce a tremendous amount of research about what's going on in our communities and use that to advocate both within our system and to the state government about what kind of resources that we need um, to apply. So for example, recently there were some studies that were published in the journal of the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics, which was produced by public health professors uh, here at UC Merced, in which they were examining food insecurity in the time of COVID. Uh, the piece in, in the journal is called Structural Barriers Influencing Food Insecurity, Malnutrition and Health Among Latinas During and After COVID-19, Considerations and Recommendations. And so the research uh, institution role that we play within the Central Valley is helpful to not only kind of uncover what's going on and highlighting the problems that are existing in our surrounding communities. Uh, but it also, when we do have to go and make um, cases for why we should have budget and resources to do the things that we need to do, uh, as the Office of Sustainability, it's helpful that we can go and partner up with faculty who might be doing research on this topic. So, if, you know, if we're, if we're trying to do work on zero waste or we're trying to do work on water issues, there's a good chance that there is uh, someone on our campus who's either doing that research themselves or has a graduate uh, team of graduate researchers. And, and what that helps us do uh, is have, you know, this, this base of knowledge that we can use to go into our meetings and say, this is, this is what we know is going on in our community. And this is the programs that we're developing in order to tackle this issue. And this is why we're requesting this amount of money. Um, and and that 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 makes our job, uh, I would say, uh, easier to do since we're working a lot uh, in evidence-based arguments uh, with this research. And um, I would say, if if you're encountering issues with 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 uh, organization, and there's always a resource disparity in, in organizations in the nonprofit world. It's very difficult to have the staff time right to find this research or do this research themselves and so they're always resource stressed so it's um, good to see where you can partner up with other organizations or if you have if there are um, academic research institutions nearby who are willing to do um, collaborative community-based research that can be um, a benefit to your advocacy work Yeah, thank you for that. that. That's very helpful. And I can tell you, uh, here in the upper Midwest with you, Harriet, we are uh, the folks at the Twin Cities campus in Minnesota. There's some good folks there uh, that we can get you connected to that might be helpful. And of course, here at Wisconsin, I'm the, I was the founder of, besides Farm to Facts, I founded the Kaufman Lab for the study of food systems. We do a lot of work again, nationally and internationally with organizations in support of their goals. Um, other thoughts or questions, folks? Uh, 
<clears throat> Ask Guillermo anything. Ask Memo anything. <laughs> Ask Morales anything. Well, here's a question that it has to do with uh, the whole COVID situation. We used to have a market that was sort of uh, in a central, uh, sort of a circular um, place. And then as we added on, we'd have vendors kind of going out from there and not every vendor got seen by everybody. So when we had to do the one-way walkthrough, many vendors said to me, this is great. Everybody that comes here is walking by my booth. And I think that that's a plus we're taking away from from the whole pandemic. And I'm really um, not wanting to go back to that old system and, and uh, hoping that we do ask people, when are we going back to the old way? Well, I don't think we are going back. And um, the farther, the longer we keep it this way, the better, because I'm seeing part vendors that, that don't, maybe don't shine quite as much as others. I'm seeing that they're getting more attention. Um, people are asking for them. So that's, you know, you I'm trying to take away positives from what we've been through these last couple of years. And it, that seems to really be helpful. I think it's true. I think one of the things, the problem of institutional is you get habits. People get these habits in mind. And right. what we need is to shake up our habits sometimes. And COVID did shake us up a little bit. Yes. And again, I've written elsewhere in, a, in an article for a professional journal, the title, Differentiate or Die. And that is basically to say, if we don't, if we put all of our eggs in one basket and right. make ourselves hab habituate ourselves to that one basket, we're going to be in trouble. Yeah. Well, and I do want COVID's going to happen again. Yeah. This market in Manola does have some room to grow. We've only got 30, 30 vendors. And one of the other things that I had to do, which has turned out to be a plus by creating the one way market, I would the music no longer there was no middle anymore where the music was so i've moved the music into the park and what what i find is people are staying longer because it's on grass it's under trees instead of concrete they're buying things to eat there they're going to the picnic table they're socializing and it's expanding the community uh feeling of this market that's always been true for for monona yeah and i and i think um I think Alfonso, you rightly pointed out that uh, how powerful ha uh, the formation of habits can be. And I know the conversation around the labor market in the United States during COVID is, you know, people who can work from home, people who are going to have to go into the office. I think for decades, right? It was, uh, you know, a lot of, for a lot of, a lot of people, you went yep. into an office, you did your nine to five. And COVID makes us re-examine. It's like, well, that situation might work in certain conditions and it might not work in others. And so thinking about what is the flexibility and what is the uh, evolution, I think, Claudia, like you mentioned, that you're seeing that, you know, there's there's definitely pros and cons to doing things the way they used to be. And yeah. that, but, not, but, but, but now you're exploring new options and you see new benefits, right? New social benefits. Yeah from community members coming together, uh, you know, and, and, and the benefits for folks who participate in the market itself. So really it just becomes a conversation of like, you know, examining our habits that we've developed and say, do these, do these ultimately serve us at the end of the day? Does this, uh, does this help us reach the, the goals that we have set out for ourselves? And if they don't, then we can, we can try and form different habits. Exactly. Different relationships. We might have to adjust our goals, you know, but we do that. Something that you said, Claudia, that I think is very important and bears repeating is the question of design. Okay. The question of design. So, you know, one of my colleagues is, a, is Professor Edna Ledesma. Edna, Professor yes. Ledesma is from South Texas. She is both a master's in architecture and a PhD in urban planning. And I just dropped into the chat uh, a link to a study that she did uh, that incorporates design and food and marketplaces. Mm -hmm. uh, she's done work also, uh, award-winning work with uh, Latino markets in California and Texas. Mm -hmm. 
then as well as uh, work in in other work in Wisconsin. So okay. she's so so I think it's important to remember that design can help facilitate relationships, actual yeah. physical design uh, of of these things. So yeah, yeah. Go ahead. Other thoughts? Ask ask. Uh, yeah, here's anything. another another aspect that is pretty difficult at times to deal with, but not always. There's a group of older farmers. They're mostly white. They're set in their ways, um, mostly not organic, um, but they have huge followings. This is at our market. And then we have uh, Hmong farmers. We have Hispanics. Uh, and then we have these younger white farmers who are farming organically and sustainably. And there's tensions between the younger white farm, well, it comes from the older white farmers and the younger white farmers are, you know, they're seeing that new group and, and that they're doing things differently. And they've got these organic certified signs on their stands. Um, and, and that's something that I just kind of watch and pay, pay attention to that we had a flare up over an issue it's I you know I, I think it was it's taken care of but I don't know if it would have happened it had been the old guy next to her rather than the young guy behind her <laughs> um it's just interesting this these relationships no you know it's a, you know, it's important that you know there's it's a uh, it's community like family right isn't always right. sunshine right. and rainbows it's uh and I say that to mean that uh well, that's all right, right? You know, there's there's there, there's there's traditional knowledge from folks who've been doing uh, that kind of work for a long time that is relevant and, and and wisdom that can be passed on. But I think, rightfully so, young folks who are trying to enter the space and provide new ideas, new ways of being. There's always that tension between old and new, and and what was historically in a community versus uh, new people, new ideas, new things coming about. Um, that doesn't always have to be like a hostile process. And I think in a lot of ways, um, you can get really great cultural exchanges. I mean, when we think about food and markets and how they've evolved, I think Alfonso, like you said, you've looked at different markets uh, over hundreds of, you know, over hundreds of centuries and, and et cetera. You know, all of those marketplaces had new and old constantly, constantly coming uh, and posing forces on each other. And they developed and changed as a result of those interactions. And maybe Alfonso can give more uh, in-depth knowledge, but I, I think that's a, a, a normal kind of tension that you're gonna see and, and hopefully one that resolves itself in a way that is, is helpful to what you're trying to build. Yeah, I think Memo's got it right. You know, uh, I'll, I'll say two things, I guess. First, a little brief historical story, okay? Uh, about 2,600 years ago in ancient Greece, in the marketplace, the Agora, what was born in the Agora? Philosophy, Western philosophy. But in particular, what was born in the Agora was the cosmopolitan person. I don't mean cosmopolitan magazine. Ho, ho, ho. <laughs> No. What does cosmopolitan mean in Greek, in English? Cosmopolitan. Anybody try it? The universal polis. So the cosmopolitan, right? Cosmos, the universe, politan, meaning the people. The universal people were born in markets. Those were people who could work across difference, who could get along with each other. They would bring trading from, you know, Africa, from Europe, from other parts of, from the Middle East, you know, and they met at the market. The market fostered cosmopolitanism, the ability to work across difference. Second thing, today, okay, three summers ago in Bloomington, Indiana, there was a big racial incident at the Bloomington Farmer's Market. It made the front page of the New York Times. That's how big a deal it was, okay? And they came to us. 
the, the Bloomington market came to me uh, that next fall and said, we want to work out our operating procedures to reduce the problems associated with, with the market. So it, it, this is recorded in the Farm to Facts block. So on, in the Bloomington market, if you want to look at a short version of the story. Uh, so what we did was we spent a, a semester working with the market, developing policies and procedures to foster a, uh, ability to work together across their differences. I've been to that market and I was uh, several years ago now. Um, I thought it was a wonderful market, but it, I, before the, the issue, it was well before the issue. Um, they, they, okay. they are, you're welcome. They are, they're, they're, it's going to be, it will be, it is a wonderful market and it will continue to grow. Mm -hmm. They adopted some policies and procedures. You know, they leveraged the community on behalf of community, right? They right. didn't let a few opinions run roughshod over the common good. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know. I'll mention this is a little bit off track, but um, two uh, cookbook uh, chefs and cookbook authors, Deborah Madison, who's from the East Coast, she grew up in the Central Plains of California, um, worked at Chez Panisse and also started Green's Restaurant. She's got a cookbook where she traveled all over the country to markets and has recipes and pictures and whatever. It's, it's interesting, it's helpful, and it was done many years ago. There's another man um, who has worked in the field, uh, David Tannis, T-A-N-N-I-S, and he's got um, a, a similar kind of cookbook um, that promotes buying the food locally and how and and what you can cook from it, what the benefits are. Um, be, be, be the person who likes to eat. I like these kinds of things. <laughs> well. I do too, <laughs> and uh, it's it's to Guillermo's point. Uh, all families have some of the same elements, so okay. everywhere you go, there's going to be some unique things. Like for instance, when you go to Warren, Massachusetts, uh, Warren, Nor Nor uh, Rhode Island, uh -huh. and you see Warren, Rhode Island, you see the uh, Hope and Main Market. It's on the bay. It's literally a oh. hundred yards from the Chesapeake Bay. Wow. Yeah. So the fresh seafood there is awesome. Okay. Now, of course, if you go to the market at Madison, right, uh, uh, you know what you get in Madison, Wisconsin. You get cheese. You get amazing cheese, right? You get amazing uh, fruits and vegetables. Uh, you go to the market in uh, Brownsville, Texas. What do you get at this time of year? You get some amazing uh, cantaloupe, melon, and sandia, watermelon. You get enormous variety. You think, you know, you think there's just one kind of cantaloupe. No, <laughs> you know, you think there's just one or two kinds of chili. No, there's all kinds, you know, you get enormous variety of products. So every market is different the same way. Does that I, make I sense? I just thought of something. I, yes, I just have something else to mention. Um, the markets like ours that process SNAP transactions, people who have Quest cards, um, you have a card reader that's licensed by the FCC, and you have your you have to get permission to have it from some department at USDA. Um, we had an audit two summers ago. It was a surprise audit. The woman shows up. And wanted to know where our cash register was and where were our shopping carts. She had never been to a farmer's market. It, I'm raising this just to say that there are, and I've got a lot of experience working with government agencies because my accounting business served nonprofits. There's a lot of back office work if you're going to do the, the EBT transactions, which is well worth it. To, I mean, that's to me, that's one of our main goals. Not every market has a staff to be able to do that. It, it takes a lot of a lot of work outside the market. Um, but sometimes you're working, you know, you're working with government agencies that that should understand you, and that, of course they don't always. And that's an extra pressure. 
Well, you know, I can comment on that as a former <laughs> former <laughs> federal government employee. There you uh, go. <laughs> and and one th one thing I will say, I will say is, is is that the federal government, uh, just like in different bodies of government, it has its pros and cons, and it has its things it does well, and the things it doesn't do well. What does the federal government do well? Well, when you have a problem and people have agreed <laughs> to solve that problem, the federal government is really good at taking a lot of money and putting it into places, right? <laughs> but one of the things the federal government isn't good at doing is it, it often works at this macro or bird's eye level view of the entire country. And so when you get into more local matters, when you get into more regional specific issues, the federal government really struggles to understand what's going on, on the ground, which rightfully so, you know, it's that should, you know, state governments, uh, county governments, they know what's going on, on the ground. So that's why the federal government often comes as a place of giving money to states and counties so that they can actually deploy the money in the right places where it's needed. However, uh, I, I do encourage um, the folks at the federal level, one of the things I did when I was uh, working on housing policy in, in, in Washington, DC, was I volunteered to do water efficiency and energy efficiency retrofits in low-income housing in Northern Virginia. Oh. And the reason I did that is because when you're in an office working on issues that span the country, you don't really get to see what's going on at the ground level. So it's important to, for me, it was important to volunteer to see what the context of what I'm working on actually means at a local level. And so I think, you know, when the federal government has listening sessions or opportunity for people to comment and things like that, or they should be sending more people to go to these markets to see and how these programs actually operate on a day-to-day -day basis. Because I'm sure it's not perfect, right? In terms of the federal government's program and how you have to interact with it and there's probably difficulties. And if they were to send more people or get more accustomed with what's going on, you could make that process more efficient and better and work for more people. But that's often what I found from working in the federal government is that, uh, you know, it's it's hard to get visibility on the ground level. And uh, but that's something that we should understand and try to do more at our federal government. Like, you know, you're serving the people you should be exposing and getting and getting accustomed to what's going on in your own backyard, so to speak. Yeah. Fair, and, and fair to, enough. That, to that point. Uh, one of the folks we, one of the organizations we work with in in Maryland, uh, Milk Lady Markets, we did Great. their re, we did their rebranding, and we did some organizational development for them, including a new color scheme and some other stuff. But we also helped them do food security work, so we created some relationship building that showed partners in their community how to uh, get more bang for the buck with their SNAP dollars. And so I just wanted to show you that whenever, whenever Milk Lady Markets took this graphic to organizations in her community, she said, they said, oh my gosh, you know, check that out. That is very cool. You know, how do we support that? How do we support that? Yeah, you know, that sounds like great work. Yeah, well, thank you. Thank you very much. I mean, uh, you know, when you talk, I know we're about out of time, but let me share with you another example. When you talk about uh, sustainability, when you're talking to organizations about green and sustain sustainable futures in their communities, we also have developed uh, ecosystem services metric to help market managers like Claudia or folks like uh, you, Yariette, uh, talk about the various ecosystem benefits of local food, the benefits to soil health, the use of alternative power, biodiversity, and et cetera. So uh, I would encourage you, Claudia, next season when you work with your, you know, be sure I'm going to reach out to you, Claudia, uh, so that we're taking advantage of the latest science in support of society. Okay? That's what I'm about. Helping you citizen scientists, people like you, Claudia, get the most bang for their buck. 
Okay, well, I think I should be quiet now and see if we want to talk for another hour or if we should call <laughs> it a day. Uh, Aaron, I'll kick it over to you if you want to close out for us. Yeah, I will do so. Thank you for an engaging conversation. Um, we will have to do a part two so that we can do another hour. Um, but I hope everyone has a fantastic day. Thanks for coming. I will send out a recording, an email with this recording, as well as the resources that were put in chat. Feel free and navigate those resources. And if you have others, feel free and reply to the email and we can send those out too. Um, and have a fantastic Monday. Thank you all. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Professor. Appreciate Thank it. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. My pleasure. Good day, everybody. Bye-bye. Take Thanks. care. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.